Uh, morning all. Yeah, a bit of a dank, drizzly morning. It's a bit like most of February, really, isn't it? Um, one day spring will arrive. Um, meteorologically, it is spring, though. Um, in the US, the, the US clocks have gone forward. Spring forward, fall back is the phrase we use to remind ourselves of what happens with the clocks. So the clocks go forward an hour in the US, which brings them closer to us by one hour. So the difference between UK, US time is just four hours. Uh, so markets, as Stuart has just said, will not only close an hour earlier, uh, but they'll also open an hour earlier, obviously. Um, um, for us here, here in the UK and in Europe, until we adjust our clocks, um, and I think we do it on the 31st of March. Get this right. Pretty certain it's the 31st of March. Yeah, it is Sunday the 31st. So we've actually got three weeks of this. So um, I always remember I used to work late, um, you know, running my own brokerage. And um, um, when this happened, it was my wife used to see me an hour earlier because I always used to work until at least nine o'clock when the market's closed and then um, go home. Um, anyway, <laughs> three, three weeks of bliss for those married couples whose husbands or, or wives um, um, cover the US uh, section. Um, anyway, uh, last week, yeah, interesting week last week, uh, we had this non-farm employment change and I think it rather confused a lot of people. I was away um, the Friday when the uh, previous non-farm employment change was released. Uh, just, just to remind everyone, non-farm employment change, they've got that rather curious description of it. It's basically the employment data in the US. It's called non-farm. They uh, exclude the farming sector, which as you can imagine is very seasonal and distorts uh, the uh, data. I don't know why they don't just call it core employment data because they give core to everything else when they adjust it but uh, anyway non-farm employment change and and if as you can see on the screen here when you hover over the previous month's one so this is data that was released at the beginning of uh, february for january and it was a huge number just off the richter scale it was nowhere near what was expected anyway They've revised it down from 353,000 to 229,000. So uh, what is that? 124,000 jobs suddenly weren't created. Um, not only that, but they actually downgraded December's jobs as well by 40,000. So um, all is not what it might look like. It looks like the headline number of new jobs created in February, 275,000 versus 198,000, looks like the economy is doing splend splendidly, but it's not, uh, unfortunately. So the data was weaker, repeat weaker than consensus when you take into the revisions from January and December, um, because that blowout number was sharply revised or revised sharply lower, I should say. Um, we also had uh, Jay Powell in his testimony uh, to Congress. Um, he basically acknowledged that the Federal Reserve's policy, their monetary policy, is regarded as restrictive, i.e. interest rates are higher than they should be and is slowing economic growth now. And so he says that they're close to their first rate cut at the Federal Reserve, um, assuming that the FOMC, that's the Rate Setting Committee, uh, are confident that inflation is heading to its target level of uh, 2%, which I, I think a lot of it, uh, neutrals would say that it's fairly obvious it is, but uh, there's inflation data coming out this week. Perhaps we shouldn't jump the gun. Uh, we'll get onto that in a second. So last week, what happened last week? We had uh, 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 markets, uh, FTSE was a little bit lower. Dow Jones, S&P, Dow Jones was quite a, sh quite a bit lower, but that's not the market we look at. It's more the S&P and the NASDAQ. S&P and the NASDAQ, they hit new highs Thursday, but then came off on Friday. Um, as I said, um, that uh, US uh, non-farm employment data um, was the main reason. Um, equity news fell on the 
that's right, equities fell on the news, I should say, traders, investors really sort of were thinking, well, if if employment's not that strong, maybe growth isn't going to be so strong. So I think, you know, you had a lot of analysts reassessing their growth forecasts, hence the reason why um, the market dipped Friday. That's the candle I'm just hovering over there. Anyway, I've I just think it just shows the volatility in these reports and that we shouldn't really put too much weight behind any particular report. And we are seeming, seeming to get more and more revisions these days, which we've got to say, are they, are they more cavalier in a gathering of data or are they just trying to gather too much data too quickly? I always find it astonishing that they can gather, gather GDP data within sort of five weeks at the end of a quarter. And GDP is the value of all goods and services produced by the whole nation. How on earth did they do that? Uh, Paul, uh, gold, gold, gold. Uh, yeah, what's happening? <laughs> well, I would say crypto, crypto, crypto. It's, it's following crypto higher, isn't it? Um, I will get on to gold in a second if you can excuse me for just a, a couple of minutes. Um, Peter, uh, never having known, why does data from the US affect US indices? It's a really good question that, Peter, actually. Why on earth do we look at what's coming out in the US when we look at this calendar here? You know, what, what, why, are we, why do we bother looking at what's happening in the US? Look at all the US releases this week. Actually, it's a bit weird. It's not usually like that. It's a really quiet week this week, Peter, but that's an interesting question. The answer is that all of these developed economies compete for capital, i.e. If, if you could get a better rate in dollars than sterling as a fund manager, you would move your money where you can get a better return. So all of our Certainly the FTSE 100, which is stuffed full of international companies, not actually UK based at all. If you want to know how the UK is doing, you look at the FTSE 250, don't you? But no, it, it, in essence, capital goes to where it's best used. Uh, so we look at the efficient use of capital and you can move hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars around the world at the flick of a switch. And so we are particularly sensitive as traders to what affects US markets will affect UK markets. Of course, we've got our own fundamentals that affect our markets in particular as well. Of course, we've got Brexit. Um, we've got higher than uh, unusually high inflation, which is now unusually falling, uh, outstripping other economies um, in terms of uh, the readjustment in inflation. So, but typically, these big moves that we see due to non-farm payroll in the US. Remember, the US is the largest global economy and the US central bank is the most important central bank. Uh, and when this employment data comes out, that is one of the, the, the central bank's policy mandates is to maintain full employment. So when the date, the employment data is released, we know that will affect Fed thinking towards their decisions on interest rates and interest rates affects corporate borrowings, uh, retail borrowings, mortgages, loans, corporate loans, everything, everything. So, uh, and that spills over into our European and UK markets as well. Good question though. Thank you for asking that, Peter. Uh, okay, so we've um, looked at um, the effect. We can see what the effect has been on interest rates because that's something that I've just mentioned. Um, despite the weaker in, weaker growth implied by the jobs data that came in weaker, there actually has been little movement uh, in the forward rates uh, with, with the prospect of the first rate cut now on the 12th of June. If I hover over the 12th of June, you can see here that the probability of a rate cut to five to five and a quarter from five and a quarter to five and a half is now 57.3% and 16.1% for a, a half point cut. But when you add the two up, there's a majority expecting at least a quarter with a 16% probability of a half point uh, cut in June. Uh, and that has only changed by about, yeah, well, it's actually shifted, hasn't it? It's shifted, it's shifted a little bit. In fact, if anything, um, 
the pro yeah the probability is in is increased yeah but uh, but only modestly not enough to uh, explain why equities have come off because you'd think with a higher probability of a rate cut happening in June that the markets would be excited by it but uh, um, no I think um, I think it's the uncertainty about the jobs number and the implication uh, for growth in the US and after all that's really what excites investors as to how much the uh, economy has the potential to grow and if the um, employment data is implying that companies aren't employing so many people as that was first thought then maybe companies aren't growing and if companies aren't growing that's not so good anyway it's just one number and remember one swallow does not make a summer uh, etc uh, the european central bank we had an update from the european central bank as well with the um their policy announcement um they kept rates unchanged as we know that was a, a bit of a, a gimme the main refugee rate staying at four and a half percent um but they've updated the market with its uh, forecast about growth and inflation uh, but just remember the eurozone along with the uk uh, lags the us by some margin uh, as regards gross domestic product i.e., how the economy is growing uh, but the ecb is still and it has to be mindful uh, of the outlook for inflation uh, in the uh, in the trading block and i think the statement from the european central bank following the unchanged rates announcement said that the bank lowered its annual inflation forecast was christine lagarde who is the chairperson of the European Central Bank, suggested market pricing for a June rate cut was coming into line with policymaker outlook. So what that means is that the forward rates, the swaps for June, are implying a rate cut in the Eurozone, which Christine Lagarde said is, uh, that's what the, um, the uh, European Central Bank Commission is considering as well. Uh, the European Central Bank also updated its forecast uh, from December 2023, that's when it last published these numbers, and now expects inflation to average 2.3% in 2024, down from 2.7% back in uh, December 23, um, with a target of 2% being met in 2025. So isn't it weird? You know, we had inflation just going out of control. Uh, and then a year and a half ago, it all started to, started to ebb. And here we are. Even in the UK, we believe we're going to fall back below. The OBR expects us to fall back below the official target rate of 2% sometime later this year. Anyway, um, the European Central Bank also revised its growth forecast downwards to 0.6% in 2024 from 0.8%. Curiously, the OBR have upgraded the UK's growth forecast. It's a right old melting pot, isn't it? And of course it is, because circumstances change you know, data comes out that paints a, a, a slightly different picture. And it's it's quite right that institutions like the OBI, like the Bank of England, like any economist, like any um, broker, to provide the, an update on their on their um, understanding of what, they, what the um, numbers are saying. Anyway, there we go, there we go. Okay, what happened in the UK? Well, we had the budget. Yeah, of course we did. Um, the UK government released their spring budget. It's uh, um, often be moved around to the autumn and the spring and whatever, but the but the release of the spring budget where the Chancellor stood up for just over an hour last Wednesday at 12.30, uh, introduced a number of measures designed to stimulate the jobs market. And I think uh, the focus in the UK is to benefit uh, those uh, in work. Uh, and I hear you all saying, but what about us pensioners and us savers? Uh, because cutting the national insurance uh, rate does not benefit anyone uh, just paying tax on their um, income, on their earnings from uh, their investments. Uh, but that's what he's done. The second cut, uh, now total of 4p of the employer's national, sorry, employee's national insurance. So, so that's individuals, not what companies pay. Uh, anyway, it's sort of okay. Uh, it's beneficial, but it's been countered pretty much by the freezing of tax bans, which brings more and more people, uh, more and more workers into the higher rate tax bans. And that's uh, something known as fiscal drag. And that's what's going to raise huge quantities of money uh, over the next sort of three or four years. Um, 
FTSE was down. Let's have a quick look. FTSE 100. Uh, but this isn't the picture, although I can't show you the FTSE 250. The FTSE 100 was down on the week just by about half a percent. But the 250, which is more UK PLC, if you know what I mean, that rallied uh, certainly 1.8 percent from Tuesday's close, uh, which was before the budget. So uh, looking pretty good. And I think sterling's strength uh, reflects the better uh, economic performance recently and the political, I suppose you could call it stability that the, the Prime Minister Sunak has brought to bear on uh, things. Um, and this provides a bit more confidence uh, in the UK outlook as well. So uh, yeah, let's ring that bell for the UK. Uh, quickly, currencies, uh, dollar, particularly weak last week. Here, here's the chart of the euro. In fact, you can get the dollar index down at the bottom, a US dollar index. You can see uh, falling quite sharply last week. There are no longer any seasonal factors supporting the dollar, which tends to do quite well in the first couple of months of the new year. Uh, all majors really gained on the US dollar last week. Sterling continued to outperform. Here's the chart of cable or US uh, sterling versus the US dollar. Um, it touched its highest level versus the dollar since late July last year. Um, as I said, investors are really focusing on the improving business, business service, which have come out pretty pretty good. Uh, and they're predictors of, uh, good predictors of future economic activity. Um, but it's not just against the dollar. Look at it, look at the Euro sterling. So here's the, uh, Sterling strengthening against the euro. You've got to go back a long way to see, uh, you know, it could take us back to sort of August last year. Um, yeah. But if it goes, if it falls below that, then you have to go back an even longer way. I mean, it could um, end up uh, going all the way back to sort of August 22, yeah, whatever that is, 19 months away. Um, anyway, uh, other currencies, Japanese yen, we've been looking at that, um, the dollar yen, um, particularly the, the dollar was particularly weak uh, versus the Japanese yen, having been sort of bobbling around the 150 level, uh, fell from 150 to 147 last week as traders speculate about, about the Bank of Japan's next policy announcement, and that's all happening next week, whilst the calendar this week's a bit thin on the ground next week. Wow, we've got a pretty busy schedule. So uh, it's going to be a bit dull this week on the data front, but not necessarily on the trading front. Next week, you're going to have to listen to me really closely because there'll be a lot to talk about. Uh, precious metals, well, gold, you want to talk about gold. That accelerated significantly last week on the back of sharp gains in um, crypto assets, not currencies, they're not currencies, they're just assets, unbacked assets, um, further central bank buying, I'm sure, and a good dose of speculative buying, uh, and we are making all-time highs in gold, so there's no sort of level necessarily that it it might stop it apart from the sort of psychological $2,200 level, and we're only, what, 20 bucks away from that. So that's uh, in percentage terms is um, just a, a mere jot. Um, and I think, what was it, four and a half percent gain on the week? I mean, that really is significant. I think the fall in the US dollar also played its part as uh, gold. I think it, it notched up its, is it third weekly gain? A quick look. Yeah. One, two, three. Yeah, third weekly gain. I mean, that's, that's quite a significant move since. Um, sort of mid-Feb, that really is uh, quite some gain. Um, oil, uh, quick look at oil, oil weaker, um, down about 2% last week off uh, a buck 50, but when you look at the chart, it's sort of flip-flopping in a range. This is Brent crude or, or UK oil, so it's sort of trading between 83 and a half and um, eight. 80 and a half, so it's stuck in the three buck range and has been really since sort of early February. Um, and in a way, you just think with the conflict in the Middle East, you expect it to be way, way higher, but um, that's not really happening. Uh, and it is reacting to the sort of ebb and flow of news in the Middle East. Um, and I think the US administration's move to construct this peer 
and bring this much needed aid and food and supplies by ship to Gaza, I think could and possibly help allay fears of a flare up in other regions in the Middle East where Hamas has support. And I think that's probably reflected in the price of crude falling back on Friday, but it is just flip-flopping and it's fairly directionless for the time being, for sure. Uh, right, calendar. And if you've got any other questions about that calendar, let's get onto the calendar. Um, even the right week might help. Okay, so we talked about the daylight savings. You're all au fait with that now. Um, we really have nothing until Tuesday, actually. And then it's, uh, well, <laughs> the only non-US uh, data. Actually, we've got another data release. Uh, it's just UK and US this week, really. Um, this is the uh, unemployment report here in the UK on Tuesday morning. The claimant count, that's uh, new unemployment claims. The actual data tends to be better than consensus or has been for the last three uh, months. Average earnings index, um, uh, three month, uh, three month period compared to a, on on an annualized basis. The employment picture, I'd say, is easing slightly. What I mean by that is, it's uh, not as tight as it has been. Bearing in mind we've been in a technical recession, it's just very, very odd that the employment market is quite so tight, uh, and that tightness is easing slightly. Um, with the likelihood, I suspect, that the UK is no longer in a recession uh, and Sterling will be sensitive to both those releases at seven o'clock uh, tomorrow morning. And then probably the most important release of the week, I'm afraid, uh, Tuesday, all it is, well, all it is, it's the inflation data. It's not the Fed's preferred measure of inflation. That's that PCE data we had the other week. Uh, this is um, the uh, inflation uh, data re released by... Um, the government agency. Um, inflation was stronger than expected last month, and I think investors will be keen to see that the trend has reversed. Um, headline inflation, so that's this one, uh, sorry, the CPI year on year, uh, expected to come in at 3.1% annualized and a, oops, excuse me, and a plus 4.4% 4 .4 month on month growth. Uh, core inflation, again, we use that word core. It's been, it's used all over those. Again, I don't know why they don't have core employment report, why they call it something different. Anyway, uh, core, uh, core uh, inflation data, um, which excludes food and energy components. And you think, well, hang on a second, they're the ones that had the biggest impact. But actually, when you strip them out, you actually are left with what is really the, the, the heartbeat of the inflation reading, uh, it's almost like what's, what's built into the, the uh, economy now in terms of inflation because food and uh, energy goes up and down too much and is incredibly volatile. But the good news is it's expected at plus 0.3% on a month by month basis, which makes an annualized rate of 3.7%. And it was last at 3.9%. If it does come out like that, I think the market would be pretty happy it would be a fall and actually the core rate would be, if it does hit 3.7%, that would be the lowest rate since May, 2021. How about that? Um, dollar will be particularly sensitive to this and so will the US and global assets. So uh, um, Peter, apropos your question about, you know, uh, why does it, why do US yeah, data affect U, UK indices? That's precisely one that you'll need to look out for on um, Tuesday. Remember, they're coming out an hour earlier than normal, so uh, make sure you, you don't get caught out. 12.30 is when the data comes out. Data that normally comes out at 1.30, it's 12.30 and will be for three weeks. So please, please set your, your alarm clocks, your phones, if that's something that you need to do. Just make sure you're aware of it. Give yourself a five minute warning before half 12, not half one. Uh, and then we have um, UK, uh, GDP. Um, this is, yeah, this is the monthly reading. We never used to get um, monthly data out from the uh, uh, UK a statistics office from the from the ONS, but now they produce monthly data. Um, and and I think markets have become used to lots of revisions of this data. And the monthly figure is for January. Uh, so here we are. What sort of eleventh uh, of March? 
um, and that data, it's extraordinary that they can actually collate that data and that will contribute to the data set that makes up the first quarter GDP when that is calculated. We're expecting a, a figure of plus 0.2% um, uh, for the monthly data. Um, and it's likely, as I said earlier on in this uh, cast, that uh, the UK is probably no longer in a technical recession from uh, the third and fourth quarter last year. But really, this is a backward looking number anyway. Uh, I don't think it'll have that much effect, but they've uh, given it a high impact um, categorization, which I'm, I'm not sure I agree with. Uh, Thursday, uh, we got producer price index, uh, that is the cost of goods and services going into production. It's a precursor um, to inflation or disinflation if you live in China. Uh, where they're uh, struggling to get um, any price pressures at all. Uh, we're expecting that PPI number to come in at plus 0.2%. So there is little pressure expected on inflation. Uh, we then have core retail sales, another core reading, another way that statisticians attempt to try and present reliable data that's not overwhelmed by less important data. And here, retail sales or core retail sales excludes transportation items, in fact, specifically cars, or if you're in America, automobiles. Um, and they account for about 20% of retail sales and they can be very volatile, uh, in which case they strip them out. Uh, so core retail sales is the number we like to focus on. Plus 0.5% following last month's rather weaker than expected, minus 0.6%. Uh, just that reading there. Uh, dollar. Yeah, the dollar will be sensitive to it, and so will dollar assets, so stock indices. A little bit here in the UK and Europe, but really it's more US, and this is a very, very big move for one reason or another. Uh, then Friday, getting towards the end of the week, we've got the um, Empire State Manufacturing Index. Believe it or not, uh, Empire State refers to New York. Believe it or not, New York State is a big state, and it has a lot of manufacturing. Yeah, uh, Activity in the New York State is expected to come in at minus 7.6 and you think that's not very good is it and it's not and it's very much in the doldrums and has really been since late uh, December 2021 um, and it's the fact is our higher interest rates inflation has really hurt manufacturing not just in the US definitely here in the UK and in Europe of course happened to Germany yeah uh, and then final number the uh, prelim reading the first reading the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment. I always used to think that um, they never revised this number, but look what they did with the previous number. They revised it from 79.6 to to 76.9. And I immediately thought, well, surely someone wrote the number down wrong. It almost looks like a typo. Um, and it was um, just a bit out of whack. Anyway, this month's number expected at 77.3. And the dollar will be sensitive to that. I like numbers like this, that they're a good indicator of where an economy will be going. Uh, happy consumers spend more, and when they spend more, the economy tends to do well. And if you want to look at how that's going, you can you can see how sentiment has improved uh, after it just dipped horrendously as inflation took hold. And there's been a just a gradual improvement, um, which is good to see, and that's reflected, you know. That's reflected in these markets. Uh, look where the S&P and the NASDAQ are at, at, at record highs. Yeah. Uh, finally, if you're interested, Russia goes to the polls on on um, Friday uh, for their for their president voting for their president, uh, Mr. Putin. Uh, concludes on on next Sunday. Um, all a bit bizarre, really. It makes a complete mockery of uh, the democratic process, and I'm, I just bemused why they go through it but of course they want to they want to pretend that they're in a democracy a bit like Iran last week and Russia you know a, a, any candidate that receives the slightest bit of support is barred from standing hey that's that's really democratic eh? Um, anyway it's a spectacle that demonstrates how lucky we are in the in the west I guess yeah uh, that's it you've been a bit quiet it's either because 
you love hearing my dulcet tones you don't want me to be interrupted you've either fallen asleep you're having your toast <laughs> sean you're very quick to say helpful session so, so you you were listening i know you're all listening you always say you're listening i think you're just very polite and just like to listen intently uh, no it's fine and i'm sure if you do do have any questions you would have fired them off and i'm very happy to answer and uh, if you want to quickly ask them but uh, um dom that's very kind um paul all the best yep um, I, I'm off to Cheltenham to uh, this evening uh, for three days to see if I can shed a few pounds, if you know what I mean. Uh, the National Hunt Racing, great way of losing some money. Anyway, listen, you all have a very good week. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Um, I, I do keep in touch with the markets. So I take all my paraphernalia, iPads and God knows what. But listen, have a, a good rest of the week. Uh, uh, I will be back in front of my screens actually uh, Thursday, late Thursday afternoon. But uh, in the meantime, good luck with the markets. The weather's going to improve. Apparently it's going to get warmer at the end of the week. And uh, I'll be with you again next Monday. Yep. Thanks very much. Well, everyone have a good uh, rest of the week. Bye now. Mm -hmm.